Um, before anything, we would like to start this industrial in Shawwal with a recitation with our beloved Sheikh Ahmed Badawi for the Bible of Shawwal. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أنفوا بالعبود أحلت لكم بهيمة الأنعام إلا ما يتلى عليكم غير رب للصيد in order to give the people the ability to hear online. Alhamdulillah, tonight, after a long time of a planning, more than a year, you can say, the masjid is working very hard in order to establish this kind of office. And alhamdulillah, we have decided tonight to launch this campaign to our community that alhamdulillah, now we can say we have an Islamic Finance Services Office. What's the vision of this office? The vision is spreading knowledge about financial matters from Islamic Sharia perspective. Practicing Islamic financial concepts in a professional way. Guiding Muslim community to the riskness of the financial mu'amalat in the Islamic Sharia. Contributing to build the Rashid organizations. As you know, brothers, two years ago we have announced on Laylatul Qadr that our plan, our future plan for this beautiful community to build lots of projects. As you know, on the table now, we have a senior home, we have a second school to come, and we have a grand mosque, a recreation center, Islamic library, info center, commercial plazas, and I can tell you, alhamdulillah, by the will of Allah, and by the blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal, we have the land now for all of these projects. We have the land ready for the senior home, we have the land ready for the second school, elementary school, inshallah, and we just bought 
34 acres of land with 10 million dollars and already for five years to be paid and already 1.5 million was paid as a first payment. For the land for all the projects are ready to go. Takbir. Alhamdulillah. That's number one. All these lands, as you know, it was paid and there's some to come is going to be based on donations. But in order to build a grand mosque as well, donations, sadaqat will build. Other than that, when it comes to the senior home, recreation center, to the school, to the plazas, to this and that, that's not going to be based on donations. That's why our plan to have this office and the Rashid now foundation, they have established and they're working on a Rashid investment committee. A Rashid investment committee will work with the Islamic finance committee, which is the Islamic finance committee. It's, we have Dr. Muammar as the chair of it. We have Dr. Mahmoud, Imam Mahmoud. We have Fadil al-Sheikh Ahmed. We have Abu Bakr Abu Rukba with us and this poor man as well. Plus we consult so many other scholars in the field like our guest, Dr. Abdul Bari Mish'il. And I'm going to introduce him. Just give me a little bit of time. What's the task? of the Islamic Finance Committee because the administration they're not going to take care of this this is the job of this committee to look into these things their task is or our task is giving an Islamic professional written opinion about a specific financial matter for those who need it giving an Islamic professional written opinion about different agreements like a lease, sale, purchase, employment, insurance, partnership, etc. Offering a consultation to compute zakat for individuals and businesses. Uh, arbitrating any financial disputes according to Islamic Sharia for those who need this service. Some Muslims, partners, when they have a problem, they don't want to go to the court. Then they have a problem when they come to the masjid. And this committee will take care to deal with such dispute according to our Sharia our religion, our constitution, which is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Participating in all financial activities offered by the Rashid organization, like as well the Islamic will and other stuff. My dear brothers and sisters, when we talk about investment, you have to keep in mind, Alhamdulillah, we have very young, well-established community, a rich community, hard-working community, and they deserve, they deserve their dreams to be achieved. But that's why, when we talk about the Rashid investment, we're looking for, inshallah, now we're working hard on it, we're going to work on getting 5,000 investor, and we will get it, inshallah. Once we get this number of investors, we are going to have, inshallah, our own credit union. And it will happen. I said it one day, 2004, when we started the EIA, people, they said, it's impossible. We told them, take the word impossible off of your dictionary, as long as you are dealing with Allah Azza wa Jal. If the sincerity is there, the will is there, Huh? You rely on Allah, this will happen bi idnillahi ta'ala. Say Ameen. Now, inshallah, my dear brothers, I don't want to take longer than that. I want to introduce our beloved guest speaker for tonight and tomorrow and after tomorrow. Our guest speaker, Dr. Abdul Bari Mish'al. He came to us, even though he's so busy. He came to us from United States now to be with us tonight. And he's originally from Syria. 
and he has more than 25 years of experience in Sharia audit and Islamic financial advisory. Chairman of mem and member of SSBS for Islamic banks and financial institutions. Board member of AUFI, AAOIFI Governance and Ethics Board, AGEB in Bahrain. Member of Fiqh Council of North America, FCNA in USA. Expert at the International Islamic Fiqh Academy in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Arbitrator at the International Islamic Center for Reconciliation and Arbitration, IICRA. Corporate Governance Expert at the Center for International Private Enterprise, CIPE, in USA, Chamber of Commerce, USA. Member of IUFI, Sharia Committees in Bahrain from 2007 to 2010. Permanent expert at the Sharia Board for Supervision and Rating, known by CIB AFI in Bahrain from 2009 till 2011. PhD in Islamic Economics, Al Imam from Al Imam University, Al Imam Islamic University in Saudi Arabia, and it's a well-known university. Author of 14 textbooks and more than 60 research papers and 200 articles in Islamic finance. My dear brothers and sisters, before I give the mic to our beloved guest, Dr. Abdelbari Mishal, just to let you know, inshallah, he's going to talk to us, to give us a general idea about what Islamic finance is. Some people, they ask, guys, you talk about Islamic finance. What does it mean? And just to let you know, he will talk about it tonight. Tomorrow, he's going at the same time, he's going to talk about cryptocurrency. Lots of people now. We are flooded with so many questions about this. Is it halal? Is it haram? What should we do? He's the man to talk about it. And after tomorrow, December 26th, he will talk about Islamic contracts, mortgages, insurance, and so on. Fajazakumullah Khairan, I would like to ask uh, Shaykh Dr. Uh, Abdullah to start uh, his uh, speech, inshallah. Inshallah, uh, our beloved guest, Dr. Abdul Bari, will speak in Arabic and then, inshallah, uh, point by point, I will translate it, inshallah, in English. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يسعدني أن أكون بينكم اليوم وأتقدم بالشكر الجزيل لكل الإخوة الذين كان لهم الفضل في حضوري إليكم في هذه الأيام الطيبة المباركة تفضل May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our guest speaker, Dr. Abdul Bari. He is welcome in the community and uh, alhamdulillah, he's uh, honored to be among us here in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's given his appreciation and thanks to the community and to the administration in, uh, for inviting him to be with us in uh, such a beautiful night.
اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وتقا وهدى وارزقنا الصدق والإخلاص سوف أتحدث اليوم عن الفروق الجوهرية بين التمويل الإسلامي والتمويل التقليدي الربوي كما سوف أشير إلى نقطة هامة جدا وهي رأي الإمام أبو حنيفة في التعامل بالربا في ديار غير ديار الإسلام. Um, the first and the main topic today is the main differences between the conventional mortgage and the Islamic finance. So from the concept perspective, it will explain exactly the major and the main differences and uh, that as well it will be in a couple of points. And the second major thing that he will explain the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa when, you know, as the fatwa is famous and it's been around that Imam Abu Hanifa said you can deal with riba in the non-Muslim country or so on, uh, Dr. Inshallah Abdul Bari will explain and will uh, this uh, ruling or this fatwa that is going around. Ala mustawa al-tahadduth an al-furuq sawfa atanawal khams niqat muhimma. Al-nukta al-ula al-milkiya wa tahammul al-khatar. Al-tamwil al-islami yaqoom على ضرورة أن تقوم مؤسسة التمويل بتملك الأصل السلعة العقار وتحمل الخطر الذي يترتب على هذه الملكية هذا الأمر غير موجود في التمويل التقليدي في التمويل الإسلامي مؤسسة التمويل تشتري السلعة تشتري العقار تشتري الأصل ثم تعيد بيعه أو إجارته للعميل في التمويل التقليدي العميل يشتري السلعة ثم يحصل على قرض ربوي من البنك لسداد الثمن إن شاء الله ما يكون طولت عليك So the first major difference between the conventional mortgage and the Islamic finance uh, the num number one is the ownership and the risk bearing so the conventional uh, mortgage that there is no actual ownership. So the bank does not own the commodities or products or anything. He simply give you a loan without owning the, uh, the property or the commodities. And Islamic finance, this is not correct. Uh, according to the Sharia compliance, you have to have an ownership of the commodities or the products before you resell it again. The bank, all what it does is when you get to buy the product, the bank just to give you a loan and he makes his money off of it. But in Islamic finance, no, the actually the owner have to own the product before reselling it. في نفس النقطة تملك الأصل وتحمل مخاطره هو معنى القاعدة الفقهية. الخراج بالضمان وهو معنى الحديث النبوي نهى صلى الله عليه وسلم عن ربح ما لم يضمن So in the same point here uh, the, our beloved uh, guest speaker Dr. Barry he mentioned and he put emphasis on um, the risk bearing of that as well from Islamic finance a person when he owns the commodities, he have to bear with the risk that coming with it. 
and he, he stated the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, as well it's one of the Islamic principle in uh, jurisprudence that the Prophet وسلم, prohibited someone making money without bearing the risk of the uh, commodity itself. Minimal period of ownership. هل هناك فترة معينة يجب على البنك الإسلامي أو على مؤسسة التمويل الإسلامي أن تحتفظ بها بملكية السلعة قبل أن تعيد بيعها على العميل؟ So the second one is: is there is a certain period? that for that ownership to call it an actual ownership is it uh, a specific cut amount of time a day a month a week for that uh, person to have an ownership of this is the question and dr abdel will answer inshallah <laughs> أو ثلاثة أيام هذه المشكلة غير موجودة في الإيجارة لأن البنك يبقى مالك للسلعة أو مالك للعقار خلال فترة التمويل كاملة تفضل So um, to answer for that question the Islamic bank or the finance company or so on um, they will buy the house for a day or two or uh, three days or whatever. There is no a certain amount of time that they own it. Uh, it's exactly it's between that, the transition between the buyer and the seller of the house. So, and this is, uh, Dr. Abbari, he uh, actually stated this is only in, uh, it comes obvious in Murabaha contract, in Murabaha contract. And he will speak more, inshallah, about it. في المرابحة دائما فترة تملك البنك الإسلامي مؤسسة التمويل فترة قصيرة جدا لكن هل هذا يؤثر على المشروعية الجواب لا يؤثر على المشروعية لأن الشريعة لأن الفقه لا يطلب فترة معينة للملكية يمكن أن تشتري الآن وتبيع بعد ساعة بعد نصف ساعة بعد ربع ساعة بعد ساعتين المهم أن تتحمل الخطر. So the answer for the questions again that it, it will be illustrated in murabaha contract or the murabaha form contract and uh, the the bank or the Islamic bank or the finance company or something if they own it a day or two or something is there is a certain days that they have to own it and the answer is no. You can actually buy now and sell later on after an hour or sell now and you know within a day or two so there is no a certain or fixed time that the Sharia actually uh, put it or made it as restriction for that. So the answer of the question is no. registration of the title. السؤال هو هل يجب تسجيل التايتل باسم البنك الممول في أي من صياغ التمويل هل يجب تسجيل التايتل باسم البنك الممول أم لا يعد شرطا شرعيا الجواب هو لا يلزم شرعا وليس من المطلوب شرعا أن يتم تسجيل التايتل باسم البنك وإنما يكفي أن يتحمل الملكية أن تنقل الملكية بالعقد وأن يتحمل الخطر وهذا هو المطلوب شرعا So for the registration of the title in the name of the company or the bank or so on is it Sharia you have to get the registration or the title on it uh, or the company will put the registration or something or has to put it on the commodity, the house or so on. This is a legal procedure. It's not really uh, mandatory in Sharia perspective. But what's mandatory is that have the 
legal uh, ownership transferred with the contract. The legal transferred after he signed the contract, then he get actually the legal transformation to the, uh, to the one who buys the uh, commodity or the property. بمعنى أن لو كانت الملكية القانونية التايتل باسم العميل هذه هذا لا يعني أن الملكية الشرعية باسم العميل وإنما العقد الذي اشترى به البنك العقار من المالك الأصلي يقرر أن الملكية باسم مؤسسة التمويل الإسلامي وأن الملكية القانونية التايتل موضوع باسم العميل بالاتفاق لمصلحة ما هي المصلحة نتحدث بعدها So for the registration of the title and the name of the clients or the name of the company or so on just the registry of the title from a legal perspective it does not conflict with Sharia uh, uh, compliance so um, just they can agree whatever the you know the title will be in its name either the financing company or the client or whatever either or it will not affect on from a Sharia compliance and they can agree for mutual benefit what is the mutual benefits uh, that they will agree upon uh, Dr. Abdullah will explain inshallah double taxation للزواج الضريبي وهذه مصلحة شرعية للطرفين. So the first one is for the first benefit is avoiding double taxation. As ما شاء الله our beloved uh, Dr. Abdul Bari he uh, mentioned it in English. So there is no reason for the translation. So and this actually will be benefiting both parties. تمام. النقطة الرابعة uh, The fourth point Prohibitation of debt rescheduling and late fee هذه النقطة فرق أيضا جوهري بين التمويل الإسلامي والتمويل التقليدي في التمويل التقليدي يمكن أن يكون هناك rescheduling أيضا ممكن أن يكون هناك ليت في في التمويل الإسلامي لا يوجد هذا الشيء مطلقا. So the fourth point and this is one of the major points that will actually differentiate between the conventional mortgage and the Islamic uh, finance is the prohibition of rescheduling debt and late fee payments. So in the conventional uh, mortgage you can reschedule your debt. And that, of course, it will increase the percentage or the interest. Uh, in Islamic finance, there is no such thing. There is no such thing called rescheduling your debt. As well as the late fee payments in conventional mortgage, they, they can put it charges on late payment fees, but the Islamic finance, there is not no uh, charge of the late fees. Uh, في اعتقادي هي كل الأسئلة التي تدور في أذهانكم حول الفرق بين التمويل الإسلامي والتمويل التقليدي. So those four points that uh, Dr. Abbari talked about it, he's sure and he's certain that it's actually going on everyone's mind for uh, asking what's the difference between the conventional mortgage and the halal mortgage or the Islamic finance. النقطة الخامسة نريد أن نفسر شبهة التشابه بين التمويل التقليدي والتمويل التق... آه الإسلامي. يعني many people says Islamic finance similar Islamic uh, conventional finance. هل هذا السؤال أو كيف نجيب على هذه الشبهة؟ so um, he will explain right now and what is uh, why the similarity, uh, why the people saying, you know what, it's Islamic finance and conventional mortgage, they all the same, and how would we answer this uh, one, uh, this shubha, or you know, this raise the questions now. 
الحمد لله الإجابة على هذه القضية على هذا الإشكال بسيط جدا الإجابة على هذا السؤال بسيطة جدا ومباشرة جدا وأرجو أنه جميع من يسمعني يعتبر أنه بيده مفتاح الإجابة عندما تثار هذه الشبهة تفضل So the answer is very simple and very straightforward and he hope إن شاء الله that you will, you will know and understand the answer to this question so whenever you get asked what's the difference between the Islamic finance or the Islamic mortgage versus the conventional mortgage you will be able to answer inshallah إذا فهمنا النقاط الأربعة السابقة عرفنا أن هذا ربا وهذا تمويل إسلامي بيع أو إيجارة Understanding the last four points that we just talked about it you will have um, a clear understanding as well this is actual uh, financing, Islamic financing and this is actually interest uh, bearing loans and then you will be able to still have an idea what is Islamic and what's riba which is interest or haram يبقى أو تبقى الشبهة قائمة يقول هناك تقارب في الشكل الظاهري في كل الحالين أنا أملك بيت في النهاية فلماذا هذا الطريق طويل ولماذا هذا الطريق قصير لماذا هذا الطريق الإسلامي طويل للحصول على بيت ولماذا هذا الطريق الربوي قصير للحصول على نفس البيت فتبقى الشبهة في لماذا لماذا هذه الفروق قائمة So uh, someone might wonder and say you know what there is actually somehow similarity between the Islamic finance or the halal mortgage and the conventional mortgage saying you know by the end of the road I will own the house but Islamic finance why do I have to take that long route while in conventional mortgage is just I will take the uh, you know the short route and of course there is some sort of similarity between both of them الجواب جاء في القرآن الكريم هذا حلال وهذا حرام وأحل الله البيع وحرم الربا. So the answer is Allah سبحانه وتعالى mentioned in the Quran straightforward when the people raised the same concern and same questions 1400 years ago Allah سبحانه وتعالى said and answered to them because Allah made this halal and this haram Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the buying and selling and the transaction is halal but the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well prohibited the riba uh, in the Quran دعنا نأخذ خطوة أخرى متقدمة بعض الناس يقول الربا حرام إن كان فيه ظلم وأنا عندما أشتري بيت أو بطريق الربا لا أشعر بالظلم وإنما أشعر بأنني مستفيد أو عندما أضع أموالي في البنك لا أشعر بالظلم وإنما بالعكس أنا أحصل على عوائد وفوائد فهل عدم وجود الظلم يعني أن الربا لا يعد حراماً So some of the people will, will wonder and say, you know what, interest is haram and usury is haram if there, it was unjust or unfair to me. But when I go actually and put my money in the bank or, you know, get involved with the riba, I do not feel that. Uh, you know, sometimes I actually get more benefits of that. So uh, Dr. Abdelberry is asking, so is there is actually to be to feel unfair or unjust or to be fair or just, will that actually make something haram it's halal بالتأكيد لا لأن الفقه الإسلامي يبني الحكم الشرعي على العلة وليس على الحكمة 
So of course not. Of course, the answer is of course not. Not because you're just feeling, uh, you know, unfair or fair or being unjust uh, or just that will make something haram as halal. No, because in Islamic principle jurisprudence, the um, rules is based on the reason, not the wisdom behind it. ما معنى هذا الكلام؟ إذا كانت هذه الصورة ربا فهو حرام. قد يحصل فيها ظلم وقد لا يحصل فيها ظلم. لأن الظلم حكمة. أما العلة فهي صورة الربا، صورة الربا لا يوجد ملكية. يوجد ريسكادوالي، يوجد ليت فيز. كل هذا صورة الربا، تحققت فهو حرام. فيها ظلم أو لا يوجد فيها ظلم هذا لا يقلب الحرام حلالا. So the, to explain what is that principle, uh, the Islamic uh, principle of jurisprudence, it's saying that the uh, form of the riba, this is why it's prohibited in Islam to deal with it. The form, not what you feeling behind it, not the purpose behind it, not the goal behind it. Not what you feel unjust or unfair to it will actually uh, make the ruling uh, in it, but rather it is the form of riba. This is will do halal. It will become halal or haram. تمام. نأخذ مثال السفر. قصر الصلاة في السفر مبني على العلة وهي وجود السفر. أما الحكمة فهي المشقة. فقد تسافر ولا تحدث مشقة ومع ذلك تقصر الصلاة فحكم القصر معلق بالعلة وهي صورة السفر فإذا حدث السفر تستطيع أن تقصر الصلاة قد تحدث مشقة وقد لا تحدث مشقة وهكذا في الربا إذا حدثت صورة الربا فهو حرام وقد يحدث ظلم وقد لا يحدث ظلم أو أنت لا تدرك الظلم so be a very beautiful example of shorten uh, the prayer shorten the prayer this that happen when you are traveling because you are traveling you have the right to short your prayer and during the travel you can be comfortable or you can have you know hardship when you are traveling if you are comfortable during your travel would that prohibit you from uh, shorten the salah? No. Because what made shorten the prayer is valid is the actual traveling itself. Same thing with a riba, with the riba. If the form of the riba happens and the contract is a riba, usury, loan, or loan bearing interest, the form of it, this is what causes it to be haram, not what you feel uh, behind it. الآن نقطة الأخيرة نختم إن شاء الله كثير من الناس يتعاملون بالربا في نورث أمريكا على أساس رأي الإمام الأعظم الإمام أبو حنيفة A lot of people in North America they understood the fatwa that it's uh, come from Al Imam Abu Hanifa, that is, it's permissible for you to, you know, have a usury or interest loan contract or conventional mortgage, whatever in this kind of country. Al Imam Abu Hanifa, Lahu Rai, Tarihi, and the Makan Hunak Dawla Al Khilaf Al Islamia, Al Fiqh Al Islami, Fi Dalik Al Waqid. قسم العالم إلى قسمين دار الإسلام ودار الحرب. so uh, الإمام أبو حنيفة is the time and age where he uh, gave this opinion uh, during the خلافة time and there was uh, actually kind of like the scholar back in these days they divided the whole world into two one. Darul Islam, which is uh, where the Muslim uh, inhabits and live on, and the other one is the war uh, uh, region. Now, 
نحن كمسلمين في ذلك الوقت ننظر أننا في حالة حرب دائمة مع البلاد الأخرى ولم وإن لم تقم حرب وإنما محتمل أن تقوم بيننا حرب بين ديار المسلمين وديار غير المسلمين. So back in these days, in this era, there was the Muslimin in this uh, time, there was actually always, you know, kind of like preparing, there is most likely there is going to be a war between, you know, uh, the Muslim region and the non-Muslim region, as the history actually proved that. So that was the understanding of this time. Imam Abu Hanifa in that time says that if you were to أن تأخذ أموال الشخص المحارب الحربي فهذا جائز لأنه ليست أمواله وممتلكاته معصومة بمعنى محرم أخذها. So Imam Abu Hanifa in this time because it was a war time and a similar to war time so he gave his verdict he say well as long as it's a war time so whatever you will able to take to do riba take do whatever you want in, in this time that you are allowed actually to take if you want to take the riba uh, any you know uh, unvalid islamic contract from them you can do that because again it is it was a war time يعني ان تكون انت المنتفع so that you are the beneficiary that means that you are the one taking وليس انت الذي تدفع not the opposite. كثير من الأبحاث المعاصرة درست هذا الموضوع. كثير من العلماء تناولوا هذا الموضوع. هل أبو حنيفة بنيا valid now or no? So I think that came in English, inshallah, and people understood. <laughs> so as the opinion of Lama Hanifa, back in these days, will it still be valid in uh, nowadays? All research, it doesn't valid in these days. Because the world is different now. We can say Darul Harb and Darul Islam. All countries under UN, they have agreement. جميع الدول بينها علاقات وليس بينها عداوات. ولا يمكن. So I think the first one I'll have translated in Arabic first. So العلماء أجمعوا أن هذه النقطة العلماء المعاصرين أجمعوا بالأبحاث وبالأدلة على أن هذه الفتوى لا يجوز الأخذ بها في هذه الأيام وهناك طبعا الدول بينها علاقات لا عداوات. It means now the countries we live in a day and age with different countries they have some sort of you know relationship between one another. And now, inshallah, Doctor will explain in depth. The the concept that was present in the ancient scholars is that the Muslim, in the view of Imam Abu Hanifa, is not the view of the majority. المسلم له حق أن يأخذ مال الطرف الآخر تصور هذا الكونسيبت الآن يعيش بيننا ماذا يقول عن الآخر Uh, so back in these days, again, if you try to implement the opinion of Abu Hanifa now, when he said, oh, you can take his money, imagine if you implement this opinion now, and there is, it's a different time, different agreements between people, between countries, what do you think that people will say about you when you take the money from the other person? <laughs> محققي هذا العصر 
So the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa back in these days by the current scholars nowadays they said you are not allowed to take this opinion it was different time you're, you're not allowed in Islam to implement it now in these days Imam Abu Hanifa is not valid to Islamic mortgage, uh, to a uh, conventional mortgage, because to you pay the pay interest, not take the interest. So as well, if you want to implement it here, you're still in the wrong, because uh, Imam Abu Hanifa is saying you are the one who's taken. But actually in a conventional mortgage nowadays, you are actually the one who's given, not taken. Sheikh Taqi al-Uthmani, Sheikh Taqi al-Uthmani, يعني famous scholar in Pakistan Hanafi school أيضا شيخ مصطفى الزرقاء رحمه الله أيضا من المدرسة الحنفية كلا الشيخين قالا لا يعمل برأي الإمام أبو حنيفة ووصفا رأي الإمام أبو حنيفة كلاهما بأنه ضعيف أو مرجوح والظروف اختلفت كلاهما وهما من محققي المذهب الحنفي. So there's two scholars in the Hanafi school of thought, it's renowned scholars worldwide. Uh, Sheikh Taqi Uthmani and uh, Sheikh Mustafa Zarqa. Sheikh Mustafa Zarqa, alayhi rahmatullah, he passed away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on his souls. Both of them, they give their verdicts that you are not allowed to uh, implement the uh, fatwa of the Imam Abu Hanifa. One, because it's a weak opinion and it's actually the, a weak fatwa. Second, there is, you know, it's against uh, the correct opinion. And after all, the basis of the fatwa and the uh, history, the regions, and the time it changed, everything changed. So you're not allowed actually to implement this fatwa nowadays. Malatania, a Sheikh Taqil Uthmani, Yaqul, and Al Fatwa fi Kutub al Ahnaf, Tammat Munatashatuha, Wat al Daifuha, fi Kutub al Ahnafi and Fusihim. So in the Hanafi school of thought itself, this fatwa, the Hanafi scholar, according to Sheikh Taqi Uthmani, the Hanafi scholar themselves within the books of the Hanafi school of thought, they actually proved with evidence this fatwa is weak and it's not correct. وقال أيضا بالإضافة إلى ذلك الظروف اختلفت. بين تلك الفترة التي نشأت فيها الفتوى وبين الظروف الحالية. Total different times where the Imam Abu Hanifa used to live and you know the things that happening around him and nowadays and what's going on uh, in these days. خلاصة الموقف لا يمكن للمسلم أن يلتقط فتوى من أي زمن من الأزمان. أو مكان من الأمكنة ويطبقها في مكان آخر أو في زمن آخر So to sum up for uh, as a Muslim as individual you're not allowed to cherry pick a fatwa from different time uh, different era and try to implement it here in, in this time and you know without with disregarding the uh, uh, things going on back in these days, just to cherry pick the fatwa and implement it uh, in these days. يجب التأكد أن الظروف الحالية مطابقة للظروف التي نشأت فيها الفتوى. So you have to make sure as well the reason the Imam uh, give the fatwa, you have to look back to the history, the atmosphere, the the things was going in around in this time where the people used to deal with this time and it has to be similar to the time that you live in so you can actually do the legal analogy and you implemented this fatwa. 
هناك كلمة قد تبدو صعبة في أصول الفقه اسمها تحقيق المناط تحقيق المناط وهو تطبيق الحكم الصادر في الفتوى على الواقع So one of the uh, main in uh, Islamic jurisprudence and usul main principle actually in it which is called Tahqiq al-Manat which is implementing the fatwa what happened back in these days on these days. بالمطلق ليس بالضرورة سحب الفتوى من تاريخ ماضي إلى الآن وإنما بالمطلق عندما يصدر حكم في الشرع ونطبق على واقع معينة فعندنا الآن مثال الإمام أبو حنيفة نريد أن نأخذ رأي ونطبق الآن يجب أن تكون الظروف الحالية هي نفس الظروف التي كانت في زمن الإمام أبو حنيفة وواقع الحال أن الظروف اختلفت So to sum up my dear brothers and sisters if we would uh, implement the fatwa of Imam Abu Hanifa we have first to be living in the same uh, kind of same incident was going back in these days it has to be going now in these days so you the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa becomes valid and you are able to implement his fatwa but the uh, current situation now proves that it's total different time and what was going on in the, during the Imam Abu Hanifa's time is not happening nowadays. Alhamdulillah, I pray that we have reached the end of the end of the message that is required to be released on the whole of Islam and on the issues of the fatwa of Imam Abu Hanifa. Alhamdulillah, Lord of the Lord. Jazakum Allahu Khairan, our beloved scholar, Dr. Abdul Bari, he said he hoped that he give the message as clear. And uh, actually now you know how to differentiate between the conventional mortgage and the Islamic mortgage or Islamic finance. And as well you understood the fatwa of an Imam uh, Abu Hanifa. And most important, if you did not get the information clear, it's because of me, my poor English, and my translation is weak. But in Arabic, inshallah, I think the message uh, really reach. If you have hesitation or something afterwards, I can translate for you as well, inshallah. Jazakumullah. Jazakumullah uh, khairan, Dr. Abdul Bari Mash'al, for this beautiful and beneficial uh, presentation. And Jazakumullah khairan, Sheikh Mahmoud, for the translation. Now we want to go to the practical part. As we have promised, we are launching now two Islamic contracts between Al Rashid mosque and Canadian Halal Finance Corporation. We have two presentations. The first presentation, it will uh, brother Dr. Muammar Sawan. He's a PhD in Islamic Banking and Finance and Islamic Finance Consultant, head of the Rashid Islamic Finance Fatwa Committee, member of the Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institutions, known by AAOIFI IUFI, that's in Al Bahrain. Inshallah, I will ask kindly Dr. Muammar, Inshallah, to go through uh, the both contracts, Al Murabaha contract and the diminishing partnership agreement, some people they call it the declining partnership uh, agreement or contract, Inshallah. After he's done, we will ask, insha'Allah, uh, Mr. Thomas, and we'll introduce him as well as a rep of Canadian Halal Finance Corporation. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرشيد إسلامي فينانس فتوى كوميدي رزينتلي أبروفد and certified the two contracts that would start with providing Islamic finance for the community. Those two contracts are the Murabaha 
and musharaka mutanaqsa. First, let's uh, start with the murabaha contract. You might have heard about uh, the word murabaha. And now we, we're going to get to know what uh, murabaha means. It's simply, we can say murabaha is a sale contract. But this sale contract has some conditions and terms. Those terms are first, the asset or the commodity must be present upon the deal. Second, cost, the cost of that commodity or asset must be known to the buyer. Third, a profit margin, that means the profit on the asset or the commodity must be known to the buyer. Either it is a lump sum or a percentage of the cost. So it doesn't matter if, uh, so re there is no difference between uh, if it's a profit, if it's a, a lump sum or a percentage. So this is simply the deal. And once this deal is done, there will not be any changes in the purchase uh, asset price. To clarify this point, so at that time the contract is done, the, the sale contract or the murabaha contract is done, uh, what happens? So the ownership of the commodity or the asset uh, will be transferred to the buyer. And the price of that commodity or asset will be transferred to the seller. And that amount or that price will be fixed and there will be no changes anymore. Either the seller agreed to, uh, to get that payment as a lump sum or abandon the deal, or uh, he agreed to give the buyer a period of time to pay that price or that the value of the commodity uh, upon a certain period of time. Also, the seller may, uh, might give the buyer an option to pay the owing am uh, amount on payments over a certain period of time. This is simply the Murabaha contract. But when it comes to the Islamic finance, this uh, Murabaha contract doesn't work. Why? We'll get to know why. Because the relationship in uh, a simple Murabaha, it's between two parties, the seller and the buyer. But in Islamic finance or any conventional uh, financing, you need a third party, the financier. So there is a third party, which is the financier, will be involved. Second, a pre-agreement among those parties. So we have three parties, the buyer, the seller, and the financier. Third, the financier purchases the requested asset or commodity from the seller. So simply, uh, the buyer who needs that commodity or an asset, he would go to the uh, financier and ask him to buy him this specific item or asset to buy it to him, and uh, then will be, uh, they will agree uh, and get back to the Murabaha agreement. So then the, uh, the financier, if he approved that or if he uh, found that uh, the buyer or the client uh, is eligible to give him the financing, so he would purchase the requested asset to him or for him and then re resell it to him, uh, uh, to, to the buyer or to the client, and then 
the conditions and terms of um, simple murabaha applies, which, uh, which is uh, the cost to, uh, must be known and the profit, the specific profit should be known as well. So this is simply the murabaha and the murabaha upon the buyer's request. So let's move, uh, sorry, I'm uh, going quickly uh, to go through uh, all these slides because we don't have much time. So the Musharaka Agreement or Diminishing Partnership, it's an Islamic module of partnership. And also it's a financing agreement whereas a client and the financier each contributes to purchase a property and each has an ownership share in that property. How Musharaka Mutanaqisa works? There will be an initial agreement. So the client comes to the uh, financier and asks him to buy a specific asset or property. And there will be uh, an initial agreement between the financier and uh, the client. So basically, uh, the agreement uh, contains uh, that the, the buyer or the client must pay or should pay a percentage of the asset's value or appraised value. And the financier will contribute the balance. This contributed amount established an ownership share that both the client and the financier will have in the property at the beginning of the agreement. Title to the property. As our Dr. Abdelbari mentioned earlier, the property will be registered to the client's name. So it's not a big deal if, uh, especially here in the Musharaka agreement, there is uh, no difference either uh, the title registered to the buyer or to the financier. There is no issue with that. And the buyer or the client will be responsible for the property expenses. Why? Because he will get, uh, he will be the sole beneficiary of that property. The financier retains an ownership share secured by a mortgage until the client purchases all of the financier share. As we said earlier, the, the cost of that purchase chair upon the deal is done, it will be converted to an owing balance the client should pay to the financier. And this debt, uh, the financier has the right to secure that amount in the way they see, it doesn't matter if it's a, a security document or a mortgage document or a lien or a caveat. Promise to buy. Part of those documents of uh, the Musharaka Mutanaqisa agreement, there should be a promise to buy which is under, undertaken by a client to purchase a, a financier share in the property over a certain period of time, which is called amortization time. So the whole period of time, it's called the amortization time. For example, for 25 years. Once the, the client makes the last payment at the end of the promise to buy, they will own 100% of the property. Now the payment, payment of profit 
uh, the client should pay to the financier. While carrying out the promise to buy, the client has an exclusive right to possess the property. In exchange for this, the client agrees to pay the financier a profit. We'll get to know uh, the breakdown of that amount in an example. The profit might be comparable to the same rate the bank would charge for conventional closed fixed rate mortgage. Also, you might ask why uh, you are charging the same rates in the market. Because simply we can say, and uh, later Dr. Albari might clarify this point, because in Islamic finance, unfortunately, until now, we don't have the tools that helps to pricing, to price the products. So that's why there is no other way, especially in this country and the Western countries. So uh, the only way you can use to, to price your products is the market rates. But we can confirm there is no issue with the pricing itself. As long as the process, the whole process, uh, is Sharia compliant. Payment agreements, arrangements, sorry. The client carries out the promise to buy. So we have a promise to buy over 25 years, let's say. So during those 25 years, we will have payment arrangements. So those uh, payment arrangements, each is for a certain time, uh, period of time. So we have uh, uh, arrangement payment for three years or for five years or whatever uh, the two parties agreed on. In each term, the client purchases a portion of the financier share in the property. For example, they might agree to, uh, to sell 5%, 10% or 15% of the financier share in that property and makes regular payments to pay off that portion. I know there are a lot of um, information, so I'm gonna simplify this information in example to get you to know that better. So here's the example. So let's say we have a house that's worth $300,000. The down payment, the down payment by the client, which is the client's contribution, initial contribution, let's say 20% uh, of the value of that uh, uh, house, so that means he has to pay $60,000. That means the financier uh, already agreed to pay the balance, which is $240,000. And that uh, uh, will be 80% 80, uh, uh, of the property ownership. And they agreed the amortization period for 25 years. So now, this is the uh, initial agreement. Upon the, uh, uh, signing the agreement, they will also sign an initial payment arrangement. So they agreed the uh, share to be purchased by the client is uh, uh, extra or additional 25%. Other than 20, uh, the 20% 20 he contributed uh, first. And the cost of those 25% uh, is 60,000. The cost. And the profit margin is 5% and the term is for five years. Is it clear? I don't think so. <laughs> Now profit and the purchase, let's do some mass calculation. The profit 
for that uh, agreement or for that term will be 15,000, which is a 5% for five years times the cost of that share. So we resulted in uh, 15,000. Also, the other payment the client has to pay is uh, because he possess, as we said earlier, he possess, uh, has a sole uh, possession of the property, right? So uh, first he uh, has to pay the purchase, uh, the, what, she, what he purchased, and also he has to pay the rent for the possession, the whole property. So how we calculate that? Uh, so we'll re result uh, that in uh, $45,000 for five years. So the monthly payment for the client to pay will be 60,000, which is the principal, the cost of the purchase share, plus the 15,000 is the profit on that share, plus the 45,000, which is the rent during those two five uh, year terms. Divided by 60 months because we have uh, five, five years term. So that means the monthly payment will be $2,000. So after uh, the initial agreement is done, the ownership share at the end of this uh, initial agreement the client's share will be the 20% plus the 25%. So now he has a 45% of ownership of that property. And the financier shares will be 55%. So at the end of the, that term, the two parties might agree to, uh, to enter a new payment arrangement or they might choose to terminate the contract and there will another process where we're gonna talk about that later. So thank you for listening. This is uh, uh, briefly uh, explanation about the two contracts. If you have a questions about that, I know you have a lot of questions about that. So until we finish our the whole presentation, we're going to uh, answer your question, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Muammar. Jazakallah khairan, may Allah reward you. Uh, I would like to have, uh, on behalf of you, brother and sister, and on behalf of the administration, to thank uh, Dr. Muammar for spending so much time so with us for over a year and a half, tens of meetings for uh, a global power. So you can have something. Imagine every week this one doesn't work. Sometimes one hour, one hour, this three is hours, internet. in order to reach such a payment on the Baraba and declining the partnership agreement. Uh, my dear brother and sister, I would like to welcome Mr. John and Mr. Uh, Thomas Lukasu. Uh, Mr. Thomas, uh, he is uh, going to give us the representation on behalf of his company, known by Media Very good, thank Finance you. Corporation. Uh, Mr. Thomas is a former Deputy Premier, Minister of Education, Minister of Employment and Immigration, Minister of Enterprise and Advanced Education, Minister of Jobs, Skills, Training and Labor. Parliamentary Secretary of Municipal Affairs, Deliver an Entrepreneurial Think Tank, Focus on Corporate and Community Development, Governance okay. and Implementation so, in local, okay. national, and international environments. Inshallah, Mr. Uh, Thomas, he will uh, give us the presentation, and the mic is yours now. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you uh, to the whole fatwa committee and uh, Sheikh, uh, thank you uh, for 
for having uh, us over here. Uh, this is my uh, colleague, my friend, uh, John Staten, uh, who is a local lawyer. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a history. Uh, almost two years ago, let me start again. <laughs> Salam alaikum. Thank you to the entire Fatwa Committee chefs. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, uh, this is my colleague, my friend, uh, John Stanton. John is a, a local lawyer. But before I get started, I'll give you a little bit of a history, why it is that we are here. Almost two years ago, we have been approached by the leadership of Al Rashid Mosque, uh, by the Fatwa Committee, with a challenge, with a question. How can we set up a Islamic finance corporation that can be uh, like a credit union that can provide financing for purchases of houses and perhaps other commodities later uh, that is Sharia law compliant, but at the same time that is compliant with, with, Canadian, uh, with Canadian law and Canadian securities to make sure that clients are protected by both Sharia law and Canadian law. We have been working uh, for the last two years uh, with uh, Mr. Khaled Terbain, Sheikh's Fatwa Committee, uh, with lawyers of Al Rashid Mosque, with outside legal teams, and it was indeed a challenge to mesh together Sharia law with Canadian law to make sure that this protection exists and that a product can be delivered to our Muslim community uh, in Alberta that is safe, that is secure, that is reliable, uh, that is affordable, uh, and that is obviously legally enforceable. And I have to tell you today is, is a really great day because I'm here to report to you that, that we have found uh, a solution to the problem and that a product is now available officially uh, as of today. Uh, a corporation has been formed, the Canadian Halal Financial Corporation, um, that is delivering this product right here in Alberta. As I mentioned earlier, and you will see in the slide, uh, we have formulated agreements, and the agreements are, um, they have been reviewed by Sharia law scholars from Al Rashid Mosque, who have certified, issued a fatwa, that these agreements are Sharia law compliant. These agreements, as I said earlier, have also been reviewed by Canadian lawyers, not by one, but a, but a team of lawyers, and they do confirm that these contracts protect consumers uh, in the same way as, as any Canadian borrowing money in Canada uh, should be. But we have gone one way, one step further uh, to make sure that, that this compliance is consistent, that every time a client enters into an agreement, each agreement will be reviewed by Al Rashid Mosque uh, and, and the Fatwa Committee to make sure that each individual agreement is both is Sharia law compliant. So how will this process work? It may look a little complicated, but it actually really isn't. To obtain a Sharia compliant mortgage as of right now, all you have to do is either visit our website or just come here to Al Rashid Mosque and obtain what's called a financial disclosure form and a consent form. And you have to complete it and return it back to the mosque uh, with all required attached documents. Now, wh what is this document? This document basically asks you for your family's financial situation. Uh, your employment history, how much money do you make, what assets do you have, what other financial obligations do you have, car payments, visa payments, or, or anything else that you have, so that we can establish uh, your, your financial situation. You will file those documents uh, here, here at the mosque with all supportive documents, which is a, a, a copy of your income tax return, uh, a proof of employment, um, and, and, and any other relevant documents that are required. This financial information then is reviewed and confirmed, just like it would be by any, by any financial corporation, and credit checks are performed. After that is done, you are then contacted by the Canadian Halal Finance Corporation uh, and advised 
how much money you qualify for, how much money can be lent to you. At that point in time, we will introduce you to a team of real estate agents because what is, what is great about this program is that you can purchase any house you wish on the market. Not from a specific pool of houses, but just you can go out there in the market. If there's a house for sale, you can purchase that house. So we'll introduce you to a team of uh, real estate agents and, and you go out there and you look for the house, uh, for the house of your dream. Once you identify a house that you want to buy, you and your real estate agent, as you normally would, you will place an offer to purchase to the seller, to purchase the house. Once you do that, we will, with you, perform an appraisal of that property to make sure that you are getting a good deal for your money, that the house is actually worth what it's worth. And, and as the previous speakers were saying, since we are entering into a, into a partnership, you're paying 25% of the worth of the house, we're paying 75% of the worth of the house, we want to make sure that a house actually is really worth uh, what it is, you know, that it is uh, listed for. Once we have established the value of the house, uh, you will come into our office and you will sign documents. Now, these documents have also been reviewed by, by Al Rashid Mosque's uh, fatwa committee and they will be reviewed one more time once you sign them to make sure that they are Sharia law uh, compliant, but they are your standard promise to purchase, as was earlier uh, indicated. Uh, you will sign one of two agreements, either Murabaha agreement or Musharaka or the declining partnership agreement, as if you wish, one of those, those two forms of purchase um, at, uh, at the office. And you will also sign a mortgage agreement, which was mentioned earlier as well, which guarantees uh, the loan um, to, the, to the finance uh, corporation. Once these documents are signed, uh, the transaction with the buyer is completed the funds are transferred onto the buyer and a possession date uh, is set forward. And uh, you obtain the possession of the house and obviously you move into, uh, into your new home. So starting as of today, um, you will be able to enter into these agreements um, which are Sharia law compliant and, and meet the highest standards of, of our Canadian law uh, to obtain uh, these halal uh, mortgages. Now, you can, you can email for additional information if you, are, if you wish at admin at halalfinancialcorp.com uh, or you can just go on our website and, um, and, 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 uh, and ask additional questions if you, if you have any. So I thank you at this point in time for your attention. Uh, I want to thank uh, the leadership of Al-Rashid Mosque uh, for, for the two years of work. It, 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 believe me, uh, brothers, it, it took a lot of work to, to, uh, to, to mesh together our Canadian legal requirements and uh, Sharia law requirements. A lot of work was put in by the Fatwa Committee, and I really want to thank every single one of you uh, for your commitment uh, uh, of, uh, of establishing this corporation. And, and thanks to uh, the Al Rashid Mosque leadership, uh, we now have the first one in Alberta, uh, Islamic uh, Finance Corporation, that issues appropriate loans. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thomas, for this beautiful uh, presentation. I remember uh, almost two years ago, a year and a half, we told Mr. Thomas when he came here the first time, we said to him, you have to bear with us. You have to be super patient because such things, it's new. And he knows how many uh, trips and meeting back and forth, back and forth. Imagine for a year and a half, if not more. Uh, Just one second. Uh, can you explain? There's the one I was before we open for the question. If I have a mortgage right now and I want to change it to Islamic, he will have some, uh, reflect on some important issue as well before we open the question and answer part of the uh, Mr. Khaled Terabain asked a question. If you currently have a standard mortgage with, with a bank, Canadian bank, and you want to transfer that mortgage to the Canadian Halal Financial Corporation, so that it is Sharia law compliant, can you transfer a mortgage? 
The answer is yes. Yes, you can. If you're holding an existing mortgage that is with a bank and it is haram, uh, you can definitely transfer that mortgage uh, to the corporation and, and, and the transfer will, uh, will occur. Uh, there are, email us, uh, share with us your current mortgage documents and, and we will review them and advise you on what is the most beneficial to you from a financial perspective way to do so. But indeed, mortgages can be transferred over. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, brother, thank you again, uh, Mr. Thomas. Again, brothers, I would like just to uh, let you know we, are, we have around 160 applications in hand uh, before even we launch it. So, but of course, not every one of the 160, they are like, uh, they get the okay to go. But just to let you know, how people are interested with this. And now I, I am sure we have people online from Fort McMurray, Calgary, from everywhere. Uh, and Mr. Thomas, he just mentioned it. Uh, you have to know, my dear brothers, this is not the masjid is buying and selling the house. Huh? Because people they will ask us, Sheikh Ali, how much that house? Uh, when, do you have any houses available? Any houses left? No, Habibi. The thing you are buying from Canadian Halal Finance Corporation. Our task, our responsibility, when somebody comes to the office, you book an appointment with Sister Blanca, she's in a charge in our Islamic Finance Services office. You book a meeting, you come, you sit with her, and she will explain to you about the murabaha and about the declining partnership or diminishing partnership agreement. That's number one. Number two, they have to investigate about you if you're eligible or not. They have to do their homework. And our job as a committee, Islamic Finance Committee in the Masjid, we are going to monitor this. We are going to go through every single transaction. Is that okay, huh? Correct. We, we told Mr. Thomas from the beginning, and John as well. John, how are you? <laughs> uh, you want to say something? Yes. Yeah, this is very, uh, I want to People think that uh, we, when we call Thomas to come and help us, we call because of the credit union. We, inshallah, at the, big, at the end of the time, we have to establish our own credit union, Islamic credit union. Then we can buy the houses, we buy the plazas, we buy everything and sell it to the community. And they will be helping us on this. But in, they're bridging us now. They're helping us. Instead of us dealing with these details, we told them to deal with the details until, inshallah, one day the community can open the credit union and we will uh, uh, operate as a credit union directly through the credit union. So they agreed with us that they will help us also to uh, do this. Uh, uh, another thing is that they help not only on the houses, they help, uh, they're going to help us also if we need finance on the senior home or other stuff, if we don't do the investment, they also said that they will be able to help in getting the Islamic finance. Because we will not go back to what we did for the school because we had to, to go get a mortgage. We will not do that. Now we have Islamic finance. That's also we're going to launch the Islamic Investment Corporation, Al Rashid Investment Corporation, where we get all the community to put their investment money in and we can build these uh, projects. Inshallah. So we become the bank, inshallah. And you get the dividend on this. Inshallah. And you build a community. So now we open it for the uh, questions. Uh, before the questions, sorry. Uh, Leave it with you. I would like to thank the members of the Islamic Finance Committee, Dr. Muhammad Sawan, Sheikh Dr. Mahmoud Omar Khalifa, Fadilat Sheikh Ahmed Badawi, Lakh Abu Bakr Abu Rukba, for their dedication, brothers, and spending so much time to make this dream to become true. And I had the honor to work with them. Now I will ask you if you have any questions, inshallah. Uh, I want you to go to your question and to specify who's of the speakers, who do you want to, your question to be directed to the person. Uh, Uh, he, 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 he,
Um, firstly, thank you to everyone for this job. May Almighty Allah reward all of us. Uh, so I. I don't know how much time um, I have for this question, but I believe it's going to benefit almost every one of us. Um, the first one, if you can open to the um, calculation. I said I have a bit of question and I believe it's going to um, help almost every one of us here. Some of them clarification and some of them questions. So the first one is if they can go back to the slide where they did the calculation for the um, declining partnership, I want some explanation there because um, I look at it and I'm, I want clarification of that. So based on the amount of... Brother, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. We want direct questions if Calculation, I think that will take so much time to calculate. You can sit with any of the brothers later on, he will explain to you the calculation. No, I got the calculation, I just want clarification. Oh. So that is why, just oh. clarification, I'm going oh. to explain it. So based on 300,000 that was stated there, and paying 2,000 per month, so that accounts to um, 12,000 per year, and for five years, that amount to um, 12 times 5, 60, 60,000. So when you looked at that for 25 years, I think that is more than the 300,000, if I'm not mistaken. So I don't see much difference between that and the current mortgage. So I want clarification of that. That is the first one. The second one is on the risk of payment. Assuming I got it at a point, I'm not able to make that again, what happened to the part I've paid. The other one is the payment arrangement um, renegotiation. Does that mean after five years, we are going to renegotiate? What happened to the terms? Is it going to be better than what we have before? Because the way I look at it is that in most cases, the company is going to have more power than individual. So we have to have like kind of pre-arrangement or what is going to be the likely terms, not is going to be on one party terms. Um, the other question is, um, at what point are we going to have access to the real contract to actually have what we have? Is it after we have agreed on everything, after I've made the payment? Like, I want to see the contract and have a look at it. At what point can we have access to the contract? Um, the other question is the appraisal cost. You said it's going to be at the cost of the person looking for the house. I believe it is a partnership and that should be part of the cost that should be built together. I might be wrong. Um, is there any minimum number of years, like the 25 years, that, is there any minimum number of years to make that arrangement? Um, the last one is the loan agreement that you mentioned. Can you explain, um, explain better what you mean by the loan agreement, please? You ask your question for Mr. Thomas. I mean your questions. The first one is for the person that did the presentation. The last one is for Mr. Thomas. All the other ones are. I'm so inshallah, open to this. I'll keep the mic here. The Sheikh will repeat the question. Okay. Each person gets one question. Yeah, my Sheikh. So that will remain here, uh, and then you repeat the question that he said, and then the answer. How can we repeat the question? It's, uh, it's like a, a topic. I can't recall even that. So inshallah, that's why, brothers, if it's a long question, you can sit later on with one of the committee, no problem. But we need direct the questions that we can remember the question and to answer it. Now, yes. brother, what's your question? Uh, your source of money uh, 
mentioned earlier there is no issue if uh, the profit was an, a percentage of the cost as long as the total profit uh, amount is specific and uh, there is no change on that profit so for example if uh, the cost of the commodity it's 1000 if I'm, uh, I'm, I'm the seller, if I said I'm going to uh, sell it to you 